Red Cross in creating a safe cyberspace. I'd like to introduce the speakers of this discussion. Mr. Mikhail Vinagradov, head of the General Department of International Legal Cooperation, General Prosecutor's Office of the Russian Federation, and Mr. Peter Maurer, President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Gentlemen, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexander. Peter, you are the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, an organization that has been dealing with conflicts and emergencies in the hotspots all over the world for over 150 years. Can I tell the audience a little bit more of what the Red Cross does and what role technological progress plays in your activities? It's a very interesting uh, question. First and foremost, let me just say that the ICRC, as you alluded to for more than 160 years now, is assisting and protecting people affected by war and violence. And we have developed all kinds of methods in how we mitigate the impact of violence, how we engage with belligerents with weapons bearers to respect international humanitarian law. And of course, we are very challenged today because all the fundamentals of law, of behavior in warfare are basically challenged by digital transformation. And this is what is interesting. The battlefield, which was a physical battlefield today, is also a virtual battlefield. Those who are victims uh, of war and violence don't have only physical needs. They don't need only water and health uh, services and medicine they, and shelter. They also need information. They need connectivity. Uh, they need information on where they are and where it is safe to go. They need connectivity in order to know where their relatives are. Uh, they need to be able to connect with their devices to services because they need, for instance, to be able to receive cash on their cell phones to be able to survive. And so what is really interesting is in today's world, everything we have done in the past, so whether assisting or developing the law or engaging with belligerents becomes and has a digital transformation component. And this is fundamentally challenging and changing the way we deliver our services. And I think this is the big challenge we are today confronted with because thinking about the people we assist and we try to protect is also thinking about the digital transformation and what we need to do to keep data safe, to be, keep connectivity safe, to have an understanding of what international humanitarian law means in a time of digital transformation and how to interpret the key concept of international humanitarian law in the digital space. I see. The world is changing, this is true, and there was a change as well. Elaborating further on technological progress, let's talk about the challenges that it brings. The exclusively humanitarian mission of ICRC is to protect the lives and dignity of victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence, and to provide them with assistance across the globe. You have to transmit it to deal with the very critical and confidential data. How do you protect it? And what cybersecurity challenges you have to face? I think what we have uh, learned, of course, is uh, as you allude and suggest in your question that uh, safe data and protected data are of critical importance. Imagine that personal data of people are not protected adequately. This would make them eventually objects of attack you are either of this or that origin, you come from this or that place, and it can expose you to security risks. Uh, ICRC has operated always very confidentially with regard to visiting detainees, 
or engaging with belligerents in the battlefield. And these informations uh, need to be protected. The fact that you know where people find themselves can either protect them because it can give them a way out of dangerous situation or it can endanger them because it makes them object uh, of attack. And therefore, data protection is of critical importance. I have seen myself in our institution. In the past, our reports on sensitive security situations would be very confidential, but on paper. Today, we need to digitalize our own services. We need to digitalize our work in order to also take advantage of the positive aspects of digital transformation. The organization, as any other organization in the world, is going digital. But when going digital, we have to have special layers of protection. Now, there are difficult, different issues to do that. First, we, of course, need to have best practices on what, how we can protect data. This needs negotiations with governments, negotiations with governments where our server and our data are hosted. It needs diplomatic engagement to have those assurances that our data are respected. It also needs diplomatic engagements to ensure that belligerents would not attack humanitarian organizations and would protect what I would call the cyber perimeter, the ecosystem of neutral and impartial humanitarian work for which the organization stands. So it needs diplomatic, it needs technical tools which are amongst the best ones to protect the data that we accumulate. And we would like to be, remain, and be even more so in the future, a credible host so that people who are eventually displaced, who are suffering from the impact of war, can store their identities and their identity documents on platforms under heavy security of the ICRC. So what ha before has been protecting people from the impact of war, today data security and data protection, be it technical, in political, diplomatic, becomes a key uh, focus of our institution. And as in many other areas of work, trust into our data protection system is absolutely essential so that those with whom we service trust that the data that they offer to us are safe and secure. And trust is important so that states would not attack the ICRC because they are confident that the data we store are used for exclusively humanitarian purposes and not for political or strategic knowledge. And therefore, uh, storing safely data and having the best possible technical, diplomatic and political agreements that we can reach uh, is of critical importance to continue the mission of a neutral, impartial and independent uh, organization. Thank you, Peter. I agree. Uh, cybersecurity and data protection are within the international interstate agenda. It is true. And it is high time to look at this. Digital progress has spread unevenly across the globe. To equitably use, adopt, and adapt frontier technologies, the countries need to be ready for them. The countries of North America and Europe are better prepared, while Sub Saharan Africa is the least equipped. With the level of preparedness, the level of risks also varies. What digital threats do you see for the most vulnerable groups of the global population? Are there any differences in those threats in various countries? What do you see in your mission and how to help to fight those threats? I think there are threats at several levels. We have seen uh, uh, 
already in today's world with an increasing number of states having cyber uh, security capacities which can attack other countries or other installations. We have seen that the issue of uh, undermining uh, or attacking data of health institutions, of other critical civilian institutions as a key accompanying element of either warfare or even cyber attacks outside of armed conflict being an increasing threat. So attacks on civilian infrastructure, in particular health infrastructure, has become a critical issue. We have seen that during the pandemic, during COVID-19, we have counted an increasing number of attacks on hospital infrastructure and hospital data. This can basically uh, diminish considerably or uh, uh, outrightly uh, make medical services dysfunctional, but it has been a critical issue. You can attack water infrastructure either within conflict or outside conflict, but the civilian consequences, the humanitarian consequences on civilians are of critical importance. We also see that misinformation, disinformation and hate speech come to the digital space and this can have a major influence on how uh, populations are protected and how they are endangered. We see that uh, hate speech is something which we have, which is not new in the world. We all know that events like the genocide in Rwanda or in other parts of the world has been triggered and alimented and fueled by radio. But yesterday's radio is today's cyberspace. And therefore attacks are not only attacks on the cyber infrastructure and civilian cyber infrastructures of social services, it's also attacks and misinformation, disinformation and hate speech, which can fuel conflict and which can then transform into physical violence. And this is what uh, worries us, uh, worries us uh, really. And then there is a third element which I alluded to before, and this is really the deliberate attack of belligerence on data of potential victims which can target them and make them even more or victimize them even more because it can make them objects of violence in the real world. And so these combination of attacking civilian infrastructure, of fueling the dynamic of violence and attacking specific individuals or group of individuals uh, for their identities is a real concern to us and therefore we need political and diplomatic engagements of the international community to at least have some form of regulation of these elements which are major protection challenges for civilian populations inside and outside conflict. Okay, we'll be a bit back with the political and diplomatic efforts. Uh, we'll discuss it further. But for now, as humanitarian organizations become more reliant on digital technologies, they become fully fledged stakeholders in cyberspace. Adverse cyber operations could impact their capacity to protect and assist people affected by armed conflict or other situations of violence. This shift makes it essential for humanitarian organizations to review their cyber perimeter. What is the essence of this holistic approach that you call cyber perimeter. How can humanitarian organizations understand and properly map it? How can it help to overcome the challenges that these organizations are facing now? International humanitarian law has been created at a time when battlefields were physical and real and where mutual and impartial humanitarian space 
could be designed as a physical space. Either you have access to a city or you don't have access to a city. Either you have access uh, to a hospital or you don't have access to a hospital. In today's world, the battlefields move into the cyberspace and therefore neutral and impartial space needs to be defined in, the, in, in this new cyberspace. And I think what we have done in the past has to be transformed into the cyberspace and our protection work needs to move digital. And all the concepts that we have used in the past from distinguishing between civilians and militaries, uh, having access and support for humanitarian, for neutral and impartial humanitarian actors, all these principles that we have defined of neutrality, impartiality, independence, they need translation into what it means exactly in the cyberspace. I think the principles as such, the laws as such, are still as valid as ever. They are time-tested and they have been true before Industrial Revolution, after Industrial Revolution, after the Second World War and till today. But what it means exactly in the cyberspace and how you protect and how you create agreement on interpretation of laws and principles, on, in, in, on the clear extent of the cyber perimeter, what is allowed and what is not allowed, what is the space and not the space. This is today a discussion which is eminently political and which is at the same time essential for our humanitarian work. We have to know where is the safe space in which we can operate, what are legitimate services we can provide, what are the data we can and need to be able to share, and what data can be protected and should be protected under which conditions. And I think this is exactly the fuzzy situation in which we are, because we have seen, again, the international community having talks, having processes, to get to agreement where the perimeters of this new space, this new humanitarian space are, but not necessarily agreeing where they are and how exactly we define the critical parameters of uh, the humanitarian peri perimeter of a neutral and impartial action in the cyberspace. This is still a lot of work uh, to do, behaviors to shape, negotiations to have amongst the signatories to the Geneva Conventions. Some people have spoken about a digital Geneva Convention being necessary. I think this reflects as a term and terminology what we understand from the cyber perimeter. It's defining the behavior and rules which govern the cyberspace with regard to violence and war as in the past, it has been defined in textbooks and physical situations. Uh, thank you, Peter. New presently, wars are evolving and new technologies can be used as a means of warfare. Does the Red Cross have to deal with cyber operations? How do you overcome the diplomatic challenges on cyber? What developments do you see in that regard? Is there an increase of cyber conflicts today? Do you think that cyber war is possible even? Well, I do believe that we have to deal with the phenomena because uh, as you know, ICRC has, uh, out of the Geneva Convention of 1949, has a mandate to look after weapons technology and to support states' reflection on whether weapons technology are compatible with the basic principles of international humanitarian law, in particular the principle of distinction, proportionality and precaution in the use of weapons. To the extent that cyber-based uh, attacks, cyber warfare becomes a reality, and we all know that an increasing number of states have capacities in that respect, it is important 
that we consider whether technological developments in weaponizing the cyberspace or in cyberspace-based weapons, whether these are compatible with the rules of international humanitarian law, whether the rules of IHL can be applied. And therefore, I think we need to stimulate a discussion on the new tools and new weapons and uh, a discussion on whether they need either prohibition or regulation and if regulation what kind of regulation will ensure the use of those weapons in agreement with the basic provisions of international humanitarian law so there is really a space to explore i'm glad that the international community seems to converge on agreeing that international humanitarian law needs also to be applied in the context of cyber warfare. But again, we are not so sure what it means for new weapons. And I think what is new in this discussion and what is so tricky at the end of the day is that the cyberspace is a dual use space. It is, as we have discussed at the beginning of our conversation, it is a tool to do good things, to do humanitarian work, to create a neutral and impartial cyberspace which can protect and assist people. But it is also a space which is and can be a weapon and can be used as a weapon. And when something is dual use, is a tool for good and a weapon for destruction, then I think we need to clarify where international humanitarian law needs to be. And that is, uh, I think, a major effort the international community still needs to do. And that's also the reason why it is so important to have those discussion processes within the United Nations, uh, within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement within the Red Cross conference uh, every four years, where we try to see how to legally frame the weaponry which is emerging from uh, cyber warfare and the transformation of the cyberspace. Thank you, Peter. Naturally, naturally we are back to legal regulations and political efforts and even the need for, as you call it, uh, Geneva cyber conventions. Speaking of cyber operations, international regulation is needed to resolve such conflicts and to protect people and their rights, to create healthy digital environment, and to protect people and organizations against various types of threats. How are these processes rather complicated? What specific gaps in legislation and regulation of international humanitarian rights do you see? It can be done to overcome them. For the ICRC, Guardian Organization of International Humanitarian Law, are the current regulations relevant? Are they protective enough for critical civilian infrastructures? Well, we, we do believe that international humanitarian law can be uh, really adequate, can be translated into the cyberspace and many of the key provisions of international humanitarian law are relevant to uh, malignous and hostile cyber operations in the situation of armed conflict. And therefore, uh, not attacking civilians and civilian infrastructure, precautionary measures, all the key concepts of international humanitarian law can be translated. And there is an increasing agreement that many of these key concepts are relevant to the cyberspace. But I think in today's world, there is not yet an agreement how exactly to translate and how to interpret. And only if we have greater agreement will we be then also be able to identify the gaps. Because at the present moment, it is even difficult to identify and to say, these and these aspects are still unregulated and therefore need more precise normative work of states. 
Uh, I think for the time being, there is a debate on whether we can just interpret the Geneva Conventions in sync with the challenges of cyberspace or whether we have to find new concepts. And I think this work has to be done and it is a consensus building work amongst the international community is also the reason why ICRC has convened a high level panel to advise us on where we can easily transform and interpret existing law into new realities and where we have real legal gaps which would then be negotiated uh, in our normative framework. I must say, looking from today, I mentioned misinformation, disinformation and hate speech. Uh, this is something which in my re respect, in, in my perspective, is definitely today a new dimension compared to hate speech on a radio 30 years ago. And therefore, more precise legislative and normative thinking on what to do in order not to have hate speech and misinformation fueling real armed conflict is a critical legal gap, which reunites also the concerns of uh, fighting crimes with the concerns of protecting civilians in armed conflict. And all these difficult concepts, I think, need further definition so that uh, the international community can also, in a more targeted way, really try to fill gaps in legislation and normative development. Yeah, you're absolutely right. This is a hard process. But uniting the efforts is something that the global community has been talking about for quite some time. The scope of work is large. There are a lot of aspects that need to be reviewed jointly by representatives of various sectors of the economy and industry fields. What does the international community need to do to build effective collaboration from the point of view of a humanitarian organization? Could you provide some concrete examples of ICRC's successful cooperation with states and uh, or technology sector in advancing the dialogue in this regard. Could you say a few words on the Global Advisor Board on Digital Threats? What are its long-term goals? What will the board focus on? Well, I think the uh, Global Advisory Board is already quite innovative because it uh, it brings multi-stakeholders from different origins uh, together in one place. It's people who know about the perimeter of states. It's uh, technological companies uh, who are represented. It's lawyers. It's a multi-stakeholder effort to move forward. And I think this is what is fundamentally new today compared to the realities which we had in the past. In the past, sovereign states were negotiating legal frameworks amongst themselves. Today, we need to have multi-stakeholder efforts. And it is this uh, biotope of a, a multiplicity of actors which has, has to come to the table. What I can say from the first discussion with the Global Advisory Board, it is interesting how much everybody focused on strengthening the normative framework for the protection of critical infrastructure. Uh, we started with hospitals, but it is also water, sanitation, other energy infrastructure. I think we need to work towards agreements where we have a clear definition what has to happen in order to have a consensus built around the protection of critical infrastructure. And the second important issue which emerged from the first conversation was really 
uh, I alluded before is the misinformation piece, which is really considered insufficiently regulated at the present moment and which needs to shape consensus. And I think the whole object of and objective of the Global Advisory Board is really uh, to sharpen our the pr proposal to the international community on where normative consensus building work is necessary. And when I say normative work, this can be different things. It can be principles of good behavior. It can be prohi normative prohibition of certain aspects and use of technologies. It can be precautionary measures that states and private companies entertain in order to prevent misinformation and disinformation. It can look at responsibilities of platforms and providers of services. So we are still relatively at the beginning of defining the critical aspects, but I think everybody starts to sense that there are a couple of challenges which are closely linked to the core mandate of the Red Cross and Red Crescent over the last 160 years and which point towards the future. And it's really assisting and protecting people through law, through policies and through practical work. On the practical side, I think our cooperation, for instance, with universities has generated a lot of research, which will hopefully bring us better tools to technically protect our data. Uh, because cutting edge research helps us to protect uh, and to have uh, protection of data. And so I think the future will have to have multiple aspects of cooperations, bilateral, multilateral, multi-stakeholder, in order to address some of the critical issues. But again, the two most important issues looking from, uh, from our position at the present moment is the protection of critical in, uh, infrastructure and the prevention of misuse of information, including ransomware, which has been such a critical issue over the last couple of months uh, coming to uh, the consciousness also of the international community. Thank you, Peter. Building multilateral, even universal consensus is a very hard task. And uh, I feel that it is in the hands of the ICRC to facilitate building this consensus. Closing our discussion, let us look a few years ahead what will be the future of the humanitarian sphere as the digital technologies evolve? In your opinion, will, will there bring more opportunities or still more digital divide between various groups of population? I would believe that the future evolution is in our hands. We have to understand what the risks and opportunities are and one of our critical, the critical questions I'm always asking my colleagues is what can we do in order to enhance, to speed and to scale opportunities and to minimize risks? And on the opportunity side, I see a, a lot open and I, I, I see a diminishing digital divide, in particular when I think about some of my visits to uh, really uh, Africa, the Middle East, uh, uh, the Southern Hemisphere in, in particular, to less advanced economies in conflict, I see a lot of uh, readiness to embrace new tools, new aspects uh, of digital transformation of humanitarian work, connectivity as aid becomes an accepted form of supporting and assisting people. In the framing of risk, I think there is a little bit more work to do. 
And in minimizing risk, we need prohibitions, we need positive principles, we need agreements, we need technological tools which help us uh, prevent misuse, we need political agreements, we need uh, pilot projecting what is working and what is not working. So there is still a broad range of cooperations to explore in order to assist and protect people exposed to violence, be the violence physical or virtual. And in that sense, a lot still needs to be done. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter, for this dialogue, for sharing your views. And Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot to you. Thanks a lot, Michael.